Well, if you have your Bible, let me ask you to turn to the second Psalm, Psalm chapter 2. That's where we will be spending our time this morning. And if you're there, let me ask you that if you can, that you rise to your feet as we read God's word. Psalm 2, I'll read the whole chapter from the English Standard Version. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord, against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bones apart and cast away their, bones, their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs and the Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, all kings, be wise. Be warned, all rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. And that's the word of God. Praise be to God, it did. Most of the stories that we remember uh, clearly have a single theme that unites them. Uh, if you think about movies that you have watched that you remember most clearly, if you think about novels that you have read or the stories that you have heard from the past, one thing seems to unite them. One theme seems to run through all of them. And that is the theme of authority. Whether it is Lion King, whether either the 94 one or the 2019 version, uh, with the prosperous king, the prosperous reign of King Mufasa at the beginning, or the long awaited king of Middle Earth in The Lord of the Rings, um, arguably the, the best movie ever, ever, ever. This whole idea of authority seems to unite them all. Just think about any story that you know. There is someone with power, and they are either good or bad. And then there is someone who wants to throw off that power. They're either good or bad. And you have a movie. That's just help for those of you who have been wondering. I, I would like to shoot a movie, and I, I'd, I'd like a plot line. There you go. Well, our text today has that central theme at its heart, kingly authority is the heartbeat of this text. There is a battle in Psalm chapter 2, at least it seems so. A battle that cuts across human history, that cuts across every human heart and every human culture. The question in this text is quite clear. It is who will rule in our hearts, in our culture, in our history? Who will rule humanity? That is the question at the heart of this text. So I'd like you to, to notice straight into our outline that there is a rebellion by the people in this text. And there is a rebuttal by the king. And then there is a return or a path of return that is offered to the rebellious. A rebellion, a rebuttal, the return. Rebellion, rebuttal, return. Firstly, notice the rebellion in this text. In this text, we, we open, and the first thing that becomes clear is that man seeks to overthrow God's authority. Man seeks to overthrow God's authority. Look at verse 1 to 3. Why do the nations rage? This starts with a question. This is one of the this, forms, this chapter forms a gateway into the Psalms. We, we, we have the first uh, part of the gateway in chapter 1. And this is sort of closing the gateway into the Psalms. You, you, you will notice that Psalm chapter 1 verse 1 starts with the word, blessed is the man. And 
Psalm chapter 2, the last verse ends with, blessed are all who take refuge in him. And so let's, let's look at this. It, it starts with a question. Why do the nations rage? The kings uh, and, 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 and of the earth set themselves, verse 2. The rulers take counsel together. The people's plot in vain. Notice the words that are being used there. The words rage, plot, take counsel together. Yeah, the, the, the word rage there that is used for the nations is, 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 is a fearsome picture. It's meant to, to strike fear in the hearts of those who observe the nations raging. It is the picture of a battle horse neighing before launching into war or, 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 or the raging of a restless sea or, 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 or the, the, the bulky fighter that is forming in the mouth before launching against his opponent. The nations are huffing and puffing. They are raging. They are rising in rebellion and defiance. This is not a mere individual. This is not just one person. These are whole nations. These are whole peoples. The psalmist looks out across the creation, and you can say across human history. And what he sees are nations raging. People shaking their fists. But it's not just aimless anger. They combine the hot-headed rage that they have with the cool-headed planning. Look at verse, this is verse 2, part B, and the people plot in vain. They are calculating. There is this calculation. There is strategy involved. They are, there is a study of the enemy to seek his weak points in order to strike, to, to find where can we find this person is most weak at. What is the most vulnerable point to attack? They are plotting. There is conniving and calculation. This is not random attacks. This is not just hot-headed rage. This is cool-headed planning that is done. And, and, and this planning is not, is not just done by an individual nation. Look at verse 2. They set themselves and the rulers take counsel together. This planning involves finding coalitions. People come together, they, they take counsel together. They, they, this, this is a picture that we see throughout scripture. They, 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 there is a reference to Psalm chapter 1 here where we saw that the righteous man is not to walk in the counsel of the wicked. And why? We see what they are doing. The counsel of the wicked. The main aim that he has is to overthrow the authority that is above them. This anger is so deep and resolve is so strong that they will seek to recruit the help of others. And who is this rebellion against? Who are they rebelling against? Who are they raging against? Who are they shaking their fists at? Who are they arming themselves to go to war against? It is the Lord himself. They are raging against the Lord. Notice the word, there's not just the Lord, is, it's not just uh, master, it is Yahweh. It is God, the creator of the universe. They would seek to shake off the authority of the very one who has created them. Immediately we have the irony of this picture, right? These people would use the breath that has been given them by the creator to defy the creator. And why? Why? What do they aim to achieve? Verse 3 tells us. They are saying, let us bust their bonds apart. Let us cast away their cords from us. The good and gracious instruction of God is seen by them as bonds and cords to be cast away. They see themselves as unwilling slaves to a harsh master. It should not be surprising to us. It's, it's been the case throughout the scriptures since the fall. From the moment the serpent walked into, uh, I say walked because, yes, walked. Walked into, uh, I didn't have that in my notes, walked in, into Eden. 
And, and this is perfect Eden where God's good, gracious reign is being experienced to the fullest. Genesis chapter 2 verse 9 says, And out of the ground the Lord made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. This is a great place. This is a beautiful place. All foods are sweet. Uh, sorry, people who hate beet who love beetroot, but there was no beetroot in the in Eden. You know, if there is just a fruit that just you know just hit by the fall, it's just it's it's beetroot. You know, it's just my opinion. Uh, it's, it's, it's good, it's, it's, en it's enjoyable. We, we, we are seeing God walking in the cool of the garden with Adam. Adam, has, Adam and Eve have an unmitigated access to, to God. A serpent comes with a lie and says, hey, you see that the rain that you think you're flourishing under? Those are chains. Let me tell you, God is holding out on you. He is not allowing you to live to your fullest. Real joy, happiness, and satisfaction, Adam and Eve, is found in casting away his rules and laws. There is, the devil seeks to convince them that joy and God's reign are mutually exclusive. And this is a lie that continues to be echoed throughout history. It's, it's, it's echoed through different ways, through celebrated cliches like, be your own man. You do you. Now, some of them don't even grammatically make sense. <laughs> right? How many times have you had variations of these quotes? Do what makes you happy. You follow your heart. A lie keeps being echoed. Hey, you can't submit to God and be truly happy. You can't. And over centuries, individuals, societies, entire civilizations have sought autonomy from God. Over centuries, governments, kings, rulers, judges have risen against any knowledge or worship of God. Authorities have seen Christianity as a threat to their power and therefore sought to remove it from their shores. We see it plainly in our time. We see, we see it through governments that kill and imprison Christians for their beliefs through organizations that deny the sanctity of life in the womb, through entertainment that exalts the self and diminishes the divine. We see this. And you're probably thinking, hey, I, I, I'm a Christian. I'm, I've, I've submitted to Christ. Or, hey, we are not the UN convention. We are not the kings and rulers and judges. So this is not very relevant. Well, this is relevant to us as Christians because as Christians, seeing the forming in the mouth of the nations, these who are powerful, forming coalitions, these waves of culture that we feel are going to sweep us together with our families, we can find ourselves feeling one of two things. We could, number one, be intimidated. It is possible for the Christian to, to feel perplexed, to feel that he is in the minority, to think that the kings of the earth have succeeded in throwing away the bonds of God. It is possible for the Christian to, 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 to be currently in a position, you're currently in a position where your boss or your ruler or your culture is demanding right now that you will do something that dishonors God and you are being intimidated into doing it. And you are on the verge of giving up because you fear the consequences of what the nations will do to you if you do not follow their rules, if you do not play their game. Well, you could be a teenager here who is under vast amounts of peer pressure because of this thing that a celebrity did and now everyone is doing that honors the culture and dishonors God. And you're feeling fear of being left out. 
Some of us here, maybe in fear of physical harm. Fear of imprisonment. Because of the raging of the nations. Or a Christian could be tempted to be seduced. Not just intimidated. But we could be drawn by power. A Christian may be pushed to resignation and to be drawn by the allure of apparent power and authority. Like, no, the church doesn't really have power. It's guys out there. Those are the guys who really move things. You really want to get things done? It's out there in the world. It's not, it's not through price. getting up and doing something. It's not in calling out to God. It is in raising money and making compromises. You could be seduced by the allure of power this morning. It's not so much that you fear harm. It's that you desire the profit that comes. From interacting with this world. Let me ask you this morning, are you intimidated by the raging of the world? Are you intimidated by the plotting of the nation? Are you surrounded by unbelievers who have power over you? Who are causing you to bow to their gods of money and power and influence? Are you right now in fear of losing your job? Because if you do not bribe it's gone. Because if you do not compromise, it's gone. Are you right now intimidated? Are you not right now failing, feeling that you will fail to meet the standards of the group that you're in? You will, you will fail to be accepted by people if you do not play by their rules? And you know in your deepest of hearts that this is a raging against God and his anointing. Or are you seduced? Have you loosened up on convictions that you should hold on to with a death-like grip? Have you started saying, have you, have, you, have, you, have you, as a friend of mine likes putting it, do you now have two hands? Do you say, on one hand, but on the other? <laughs> have you been intimidated this week? Have you been seduced this week? Well, what comfort do I have for you? What consolation could I possibly offer you? Well, let me turn your gaze, as the psalmist invites us to, from the raging of the nations to the throne room of heaven. So, secondly, notice the rebuttal of the king, the king's rebuttal in verse 4. So what does the king do? How does, does the king respond this one that they, they seek to overthrow, does he have anything to say? He does. He responds. And he does so with an emphatic rebuttal. Verse 4 to 9. These glorious words that are meant to stabilize our hearts that may be feeling anxious, defeated, resigned, seduced, intimidated, he who sits in the heavens laughs. Notice in this, in, this, in this point, the attitude of God and the action plan of God. We, 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 we are, we are, verse 4 shows us the, the attitude of God. He is seated and he is laughing. The kings of the earth are up in arms. They are raising an uproar. And despite their plans, their wiles, their strategies, their plots, their conspiracy, despite their malice, their tumultuous gatherings, the wisdom of their counsels, the craft of their lawgivers, God doesn't even bother to stand up. He is not even fidgeting in his seat. He is seated, fully in control. A famous opponent of Christianity, probably one of the greatest opponents of Christianity was the Roman Emperor Diocletian, who lived between 245 and 313 AD. He is known for his widespread persecution of Christians, 
to the point that he believed he had driven Christianity to its grave. So he ordered for signs to be put at the edges of his borders. This is vast, the vast Roman Empire at the height of its power, spreading all the way from England to India. And he, he said that this is what should be written on the signs. Diocletian, Jovian, Maximian, Hercules, Caesarus, Augustus. That's just his name. <laughs> For having extended the Roman Empire in the east and west, and having extinguished the name of Christians. He ordered for another sign to say, Diocletian, Jovian, Maximan, Hercules, Caesarea, Augusti, for having abolished the superstition of Christ and having extended the worship of the gods. And on that day, as that sign was being nailed on, and as they stamped on it the seal of the Roman emperor so that nobody would remove it, except by the penalty of death. On that day in heaven, what could be heard was laughter. At this puny, tiny ping of a man who dares to rage against the almighty God. The Christian seeing that sign would have probably been tempted to despair, would have probably been tempted to, 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 to renounce his Christianity and, and, and join in the worship of the Roman gods. Oh, but Christian, look up. Look up to the throne of God where all that fills heaven is the sound of laughter. God does not fret. God does not wallow in self-pity. Oh, those guys don't like me. He laughs at their vain efforts to rebel against him. Diabolical dictators, those with nuclear weapons, terrorists with bombs strapped around their bodies, they are all tiny, puny things in the sight of God that are ridiculed. It's funny that the psalmist gives us this picture because one thing that Christians feel is that the world is laughing at us. The psalmist is like, no. The laughter you're hearing is God laughing at them. One commentator puts it, the derisive anger of God is the comfort for all those who love righteousness. It is the laughter of the might of holiness. It is the laughter of the strength of love. God does not exult over the sufferings of his people, but he does hold in derision all the proud boastings and violence of such as seek to prevent his accomplishments of his will, end quote. And what is God's will? Let's look at his action plan. And God goes ahead in verse 6 to set out his plan. He, 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 he does not, he, he, he's, he, he's, he's not provoked to action so much as he's already set out his plan. Now, notice the tense in verse 6. As for me, I have set my king. I have set my king. It's, it's complete. It's in the past. It's something that is guaranteed. It's going to happen. It is something that I have already rolled out. The diary of heaven already had this written in its pages. And what is God's plan? Through whom will God judge? The God's plan is this. God is going to rule over the earth. He's going to rule over the kings and judges and rulers of this earth. He's going to eventually rule over the cultures of this world. He's going to finally rule over the cultural waves of this world through a man, through a king whom he has set on the throne of Zion, on the hill of Zion. While the kings seek to throw off God's rule, he will rule over them, and he will do this through one man, one man who is fully God and fully man, one man called 
Jesus. Well, how do we know this? How did we get to Jesus? Things escalated quickly. How did we get there? How do we know this is Jesus? Well, because the answer is always Jesus. <laughs> but also, verse 7. Verse 7, this, this glorious verse points past all kings and rulers of Judah and Israel to Jesus himself. And here I'm going to, 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 to just invite you to indulge me to just turn to several texts of the Bible in the New Testament. We, we, we see God saying here, uh, Jesus, or rather we see the Messiah, the one who is appointed saying, the Lord said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. We see Jesus who at his baptism, as he was being made the anointed one, as he was being anointed by the Holy Spirit through the symbol of a dove, we see heaven opening up and what does heaven say? This is my son. Jesus, who a few days before going to the crucifixion, goes to the mountain of transfiguration. And what do James, Peter, and John hear heaven saying? This is my son. And turn to Philippians 2, verse 5 to 11 with me. What is this that makes Jesus un? What, what is so special about this one? About this king over all kings? About this, this spectacle over every spectacle? This cultural leader over other cultural leaders? This influencer over other influencers? Well, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 to 12 gives us the answer. 2, 2 11 rather gives us the answer. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 to 11, and I read, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Do you already see contrast between God and the kings of this earth? The kings of this earth consider equality with God something to be grasped. But he emptied himself. By taking the form of a servant, being made in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus earns this throne. Jesus is the only king who earns this title. He does it differently from the other kings. He comes, he lives a perfect life. He, he does not appoint himself, but is appointed by God, as Hebrews tells us. And he comes and he humbles himself, even to the most humiliating death. A death that was specifically engineered to humiliate. It was not so much to kill as to kill in humiliation. And because of that, he gets the name that is above every man. Finally, turn to Acts chapter 13, and we will tie this up. We'll try to tie this up. Uh, Acts chapter 13, verse 33. I'll start from verse 30. Acts chapter 13, from verse 30. 33. And Philippians, just go back. If you're going right, you're going towards the cover. Just go the other way. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news that God, that, that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus, as also it is written in the second psalm, 
You are my son. Today I have begotten. You know what Paul is saying? You see the today that is referred to in Acts chapter 2, verse 7b, is the today of the day that Christ rose from the dead. This is the day that Jesus assumed all power, majesty, glory, authority over all the earth. This Christ is the anointed son of God, the rightful king of all nations, tongues, tribes, races, and ethnicities. This is the plan that God sets right in the face of human opposition. And in fact, God doesn't just respond to opposition by telling them his plan. In fact, he will use human opposition to accomplish his plan. Finally, look at Acts chapter 4, verse 23 and following. Just in the same book of Acts. I hope your finger was still there. Acts chapter 4, verse 23. This is Peter and John. They have been imprisoned for preaching the gospel by the authorities of Jerusalem. And so when they were released, verse 23, they went to their friends and reported that the chief priests and the elders, what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by your Holy Spirit, that's the second son, why did, the, why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? And the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and his anointed. For truly in this city, they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servant to speak, to continue to speak your word with all boldness. The very plan that the enemies devised was a very plan through which God's plan was accomplished. The rebellion of man does not impede the plans of God. It, in fact, facilitates the plans of God. Oh, Christian, do not be intimidated by the threats of the world, nor be seduced by its appearance of power. Do not join the losing side. Oh, Christian, you know how the game ends, and it's a walkover. That for those who don't watch sports means the other team didn't even show up. <laughs> oh, Christians, be encouraged. Be very encouraged. God is working all things, including the opposition of some two, for your good and for his glory, both individually in your life whether it's that specific boss, whether it's that spe specific oppressive regime, on the individual scale and on the cosmic scale, God is making all things work together for your good. Hey, if God is currently managing every minute detail of the universe in a way that will give him glory at the end, how much more your life. The oppressive government, the foul-mouthed atheist, the culture that ridicules you, the wave of lies that, uh, about body image, about where we should derive our identity. You, you know those alarmist WhatsApp groups? Just WhatsApp messages? I mean, just get those circulation, like Islam agenda for Kenya. In 20 years, there will not be Christianity in Kenya. You know, and, and, and sometimes we dance and we're like, spread, send it to 20 more people. You know, and if you don't send it to 20 more people, you are part of the agenda. You know? <laughs> like, how did I get into this? I was just sitting in my house. <laughs> I got a similar message you know, on Friday. 
Islam, Islamic agenda for Ghana. I'm like, I don't even know anyone in Ghana. <laughs> hey, it's Jesus with all the authority, not Muhammad. And it's Jesus who's going to triumph. Hey, persecution might arise. Some of us here may end up in prison. But just, just the, march, the march just goes that way. At the end, Jesus wins. Jesus is in charge. Jesus collects all this and aims it squarely towards his glory and your good. And nobody can stand in the way of that. Not an individual person, not nations, not coalitions of nations. Jesus runs the show. Jesus runs the show. And so, God mercifully turns to the kings again. The psalmist here, the Holy Spirit through the psalmist again turns to the, to the kings of the nations and he offers them a, a way of return. So thirdly, the return, an offer to return. So what are the kings to do? What are they to do? Verse 10 to 12. Now therefore, all kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. One of the most helpful pieces of advice in sports, this is my last sporting reference, is know when you have lost. Know when you have been beaten. When the person that you seek to defeat ridicules you and then uses your plans to defeat him in order to defeat you, you know that you have been soundly beaten. That's just several levels of being beaten. So God mercifully turns. And do you notice, this is not just them, as, as, as Peter and John put it in Acts. It's all of us. We are the Gentiles that have been mentioned there. We are the ones who raged against the king. We are the ones who said, crucify him with every sin that we committed. We are the ones who raged and shake, shook our fist against him. We, we would not submit. We would not agree that we had been defeated. Is it it gracious of God that after he has declared his plan, he turns to us and says, hey, here are some action points. That he mercifully offers us a pathway back to him. And he has given us his word of how we can come back to him, we can return back to him. Do you know the English Bible has over 75,000 words that from someone who did not owe you even one? He, he just mercifully turns to the kings. He mercifully turns to us. And he says, be wise. You know what that means? That means accept reality. Accept reality that you have been beaten, that Jesus will reign, that Jesus is in charge. Receive this as a warning. Hey, I've shown you my plan. Receive this as a warning. You're told, serve the Lord with fear. Serve the Lord with reverence. See him for who he is, and use your energies not to fight him, but to get down on your knee and to offer your sword for his service. And it says, an interesting statement, and with rejoicing, and rejoicing with trembling. That's a very confusing statement. Rejoicing with trembling. Like, those, we usually see those two things as mutually exclusive, right? But no, this is, this is what happens when you come to a consuming fire. When you realize you're standing in front of a consuming fire, okay, so as trembling. 
And the joy comes when I realize this consuming fire is not about to consume me. It's here to protect you. It's two people on free fall from a plane. One with a parachute, one without a parachute. They are feeling two very different kinds of fear. One is just dread that's going to kill him before he hits the ground. But the other is an exhilarating fear. It's a, it's a fear that you, you, you get when you stand in front of majestic grandeur that you know is not going to destroy you. So you can enjoy it, but with trembling. This, 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 this is what we feel when we come to God. This is a privilege that Christians are allowed to feel. This is what we will feel for all eternity. This is what people pay thousands of shillings to, to, to go experience through skydiving. We'll get it for free for eternity, okay? On a grander scale. The, the, the fear does not replace the, the joy. The fear is part of the joy. For fear without joy is just torment, and joy without fear is, is to presume upon God. But come to God. Come to this consuming fire. Come to this one who speaks with the sound of the rushing of many waters. Come to this one who is full of majesty and grandeur. Come to this one whose power knows no limit, whose knowledge knows no limit. Come to this one who, has, who, who, has, uh, 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 who speaks words as a sword and know that he is not against you. That, that's possible. Kings, you can enter the throne of God and the most dangerous place for you can become the safest place. How do you do that? By kissing the sun. That's a language that we're not used to, right? This, this is how you pay homage. This is how people... Uh, who in, in ancient times would come, they, they, they would either uh, come and, and kiss the ring or, or kiss the cheek or kiss the feet. This is showing affectionate subjugation, submitting to one, but not just submitting, submitting to one that you love. Why? Because by God's grace, your neck, after you have been regenerated, doesn't feel the, the yoke of God to be a chain to be cast off. But you feel that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. You see the instructions of God as life-giving. You see his law as shedding a light for you to walk on. Right? Kiss the sun. Or his anger may be quickly kindled. It's not so much that it is the opposite of slow to anger as much as it is his anger is suddenly kindled. Hey, if you continue presuming upon God, thinking that his patience can be stretched forever, his anger may be suddenly kindled against you. And there's a day that is coming when his anger will be suddenly kindled. When the angel shall sound the trumpet and Jesus shall come and he shall tread the winepress of the wrath of God. And on that day, no refuge will be left. Kings of the earth, you who seeks to be the king over your own life, would you see that it's not Thanos, but it's Jesus who is inevitable? It doesn't matter whether you submit to him or not, you will meet him. As J.I. Parker put it, you will either know him as humble lamb or as roaring lion. Either way, you will know him. Today, there's still grace. There's still grace. Blessed are those who take refuge in him. Today, you can take refuge in him. The only way to hide from God is in God. The only way to hide from his wrath is to hide under his son 
who took upon himself God's wrath on our behalf. Hey, and the refuge is available today. Hey, Christian, this is what the Bible calls blessed. How about you align those feelings right now that you have that feeling you're not blessed? How about you align them to this truth? That you are blessed. That you are the one to be joyful. You're the one to be, to be considered happy. We who have said that we, we surrender. We laid down our weapons. We who said we don't want to be the Jack Sparrow of our Caribbeans. That's the final movie reference. We, we, we do not want to be the kings of our own lands. We do not want to have this, that the sun, that, that is only kept for the sun. We surrender. There is refuge that has been offered to us, and we are called blessed. That's your reality today. That is who you are today. It doesn't matter how much you feel stepped on by the foot of those in power this morning. A day is coming. A day is coming when they shall meet their own justice. A day is coming. So, my non-Christian friend, we, we are happy that you are here with us. We are glad that you chose to come here today. But we would remiss if we didn't urge you, exhort you, plead with you to kiss the Son, to submit to Jesus with your affections, with your plans, with your, let go of your pride. What did it ever do to you? What did it ever do for you? What, what, did, what did pride ever help you with? It is only the enchanting allure of what is going to eventually kill you. That is what power is. That is what this uh, appearance of influence is. You can let go of that today and know true freedom in Christ. Kiss the Son. For us, Emmanuel Baptist Church, we have two applications. Could we be a community that reminds one another of who is truly in charge? Who is truly in charge? When a member here is tempted to compromise with the waves of culture, with the demands of power, would we be there? Would we do life together so much that we would notice and we would be there to remind one another that the son is in charge? Secondly, look at verse. Eight, ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. Jesus did ask by coming and dying on the cross. Jesus has asked of the Father for all nations, tribes, and tongues to come to him. And the Father does not withhold anything from his Son. But here's the thing. We get to take part in this transaction. We get to be those who go out with the name of Christ, with the banner of Jesus, saying that he is Lord, with the gospel of Christ, saying to the people, hey, you can turn to him, the people of all nations and tongues and tribes and nationalities. This means that Christ is right now in charge of every inch on this single earth. There is no way that you could pack your bags today and go that Jesus does not claim every grain of sand there. There's no shore. So would this fire us up to reach out? Would this just fire you up at least to start praying for a tribe that you've never heard of? I have one to suggest to you. Some guys call this Dasanach. It's Christian Luanda who mentioned it to me. I thought it's a vegetable. It's a tribe <laughs> of people called the Dasanach in northern Kenya who have not heard the gospel. Would you just at least commit to pray for the Dasanach? That they would turn to Christ? That they would kiss the Son? That God would send? And many others. Jesus will have the nations. We today 
remember Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, that at the end of history, history ends in a song. Although the, the, the melody of history seems to be rage and anger and fists being shaken, the end of history is people of all tongues, tribes, and nations finally fully acknowledging who is Lord, Jesus Christ, and none other. So would we go? Let's pray. Our God, we thank you that you have mercifully offered us a way of return. Thank you that you have not left us in our foolish defiance, but you, the King of love, who is our shepherd, came and sought us and took us upon your shoulder as a lost lamb, and you brought us to your fold. Pray that you would cause us to see ways in which we have been intimidated, ways in which we have been seduced by the powers that be. But we will be quick to repent. We will be quick to remind ourselves and others that you are the one in charge. Lord, would you propel us to seek to see more and more people of all nations and tongues and tribes turn to you in submission, kissing the sun, in affectionate submission. It's in Christ's name we pray and believe. God bless you.